So when, you know, in, in March, when March, 2020, when, you know, COVID was really happening, um, we'd heard about it for a while and just kept getting, you know, bigger and bigger. And um, everything just started to stop. Everything began to shut down in, you know, the middle of March and it became, you know, entirely consuming. This happened to everybody. I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know. Um, and I felt super powerless. You know, it's like, I'm not a doctor. And the only people who matter now are doctors, you know, because I can't stop this thing. I can't fight this thing. All I can do is go home and sit home. And it was driving me, I knew it was going to drive me crazy to like not be able to do anything. And I'm basically a one trick pony. Like I have, I have one talent and I was like, how can I use like the one thing um, that I know how to do to be a part of the solution? And I was like, well, I can photograph doctors. I can photograph nurses. And, you know, I can, I think when you're, when you're a photographer, you can either tell your own story or you can help people tell their own story. And I was like, how can I help amplify the voices of the people who are on the front lines, you know, being the ones who are fighting stuff and uh, keeping us alive. So I started photographing uh, nurses specifically um, at first because they were the the ones right there. Um, and they were the ones with the stories. And I wanted to know what was going on. I mean, you, you walk past the hospital and it's just, you know, it's like a bunch of bricks. Um, and we don't know what's going on inside. And I wanted to know. Um, so I started photographing nurses. And um, I started this project called Between Us and Catastrophe, uh, which is about the people who are on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you could bring up the website now. Um, and so it's portraits of nurses, portraits of doctors. And then I realized while doing it that um, they're not the only people, they're the most obvious ones, but the people that I began to depend on since I didn't, you know, I haven't gotten COVID yet. Um, the people that I was depending on were delivery people and trash people and stuff like that. So I started photographing um, the other people who were like outside while, you know, most of us were sitting home watching Netflix. Um, so that's, uh, Margaret was the first nurse I photographed and it was before everything happened, before the uh, stay at home order, before the mask mandates. And she was the first portrait I did. And, you know, she said, well, we're, we're basically just waiting. Uh, and then after that, she was the only person that I photographed without a mask mm. uh, on. And then after that, uh, these are uh, some Philly sanitation workers. Did you just walk up to people at random and ask them or yeah, did you know them? I called the streets department um, and they hooked me up with some people. They're like, you know, where, where do you want to do this? And I was like, well, I'm in what, you know, West Philly. And they're like, well, you know, these people can meet you at such and such a place at, you know, 7.03 AM. So I went down there and uh, photographed them. Um, and it's been amazing to know these people people because now I have a much better idea of what's you know what's happening behind the hospital walls and I can you know use whatever influence I have or whatever reach I have to help people hear what they're saying these are beautiful shots thank you so all of these are the images are printed through discarded mask material so I've been going around the streets and you know picking up and disinfecting cast aside masks and then using them to uh, print the pictures through because it, I realized that after Margaret, um, I didn't see anybody's face or they didn't see my face because one of us was always, at least one of us was wearing a mask. Mm. Um, I, I'd photographed the mayor, Jim Kenny, the mayor of Philadelphia. And um, it was before we could get masks. And my wife made me one out of a bandana and so I wore that. That's this this picture right here coming up. Um, that's Deanna Gamble, who uh, works in the uh, communications office. And there's the mayor in the background. 
And this is a press conference where the room would normally be filled with a hundred reporters. And you know, they were they were doing it virtually. And there were like six people in there, and I was one of them uh, taking pictures. And I've I've actually been in that room. I've received a commendation in that room. And uh it's amazing to see how many people can fit in there for a normal meeting and then to have seen your photo of it and have it be so empty. It was really weird. Congratulations on your commendation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was... walked by the room outside on my way to a bar, but that was <laughs> it's about a, it. It's a beautiful room and it was weird because I've been in City Hall you know, several times. And it's weird to see City Hall completely empty. Like there was a security guard down at the desk. And at that time, this was early, early on, it was like the end of March, like March 25th or something like that. And we knew that COVID was dangerous. Um, the the stay-at-home order had already happened. And I was super paranoid. It was the first time I'd been in a building in two weeks um, other than my house. And the first time I'd been out of my house. So I was worried about going into City Hall um, you know, I was worried that everything I touched had COVID on it, you know, so I wasn't touching anything and I was sanitizing my hands like crazy. And I had this, you know, homemade mask hoping that it would work. Oh, in the beginning, I, I, I would come back from the, I would bring sanitizer wipes to the supermarket and use them as gloves almost. And then I'd come home. <laughs> it got ridiculous. I would strip naked, throw my clothes in the wash, go up, shower and get dressed again. I did that on an almost weekly basis every time I left to go to the store. Well, you know, the ridiculous people are going to be the ones who are alive. That's true. When we finally did go out, we were, to say we were terrified was like an understatement for the reality of what was going yeah. through our bones, you know? Yeah. I remember the, yeah, the first time I went out in weeks, my wife was like, what was it like out there? It was like, a, it was like a movie. It, it just had that feel like, when I'm driving down the street to go to the store, it was like a zombie apocalypse kind of scene. I mean, yeah. in the movie, not in real life. Nothing zombie esque about it. Yeah, we we picked we picked up uh, like uh, uh, booze at a liquor store. Uh, I don't know, in like June or July or something like that. And well, that's necessary. And when, yeah. the, you know, when the clerk was handing it to me through the door, she accidentally touched my arm. And it was the first time that I had touched another human being. You know, it wasn't my wife in like, you know, three months. And it was weird because I immediately scrubbed my hand with, you know, with Santa. <laughs> you know, we're just not used to being this. That OCD about anything. Well, not just this, that OCD, but that isolated, you know, that far removed from human contact. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I can't imagine how it happens on both ends of the spectrum. Like I can't imagine how you do it if you are all by yourself without, you know, without somebody to share this with. And I can't imagine what happens if you have kids who are yeah. like, you know, small. And I, you know, heard I heard a school principal on the radio saying, you know, they're ask, asking him if he was going to open the schools up because it was dangerous. And he said, you know, he had parents calling him and crying on the phone, begging, like, please take my children and please take my children. And I've seen that with, you know, some of my friends on Facebook, like, I'm going mad. I'm going to hurt my kids. Like, you know, so. I thought they were, I thought they were kidding the first few people who said yeah, things yeah. like that to me. I'm like, no, you're serious, aren't you? I, th I think one of the important things to keep in mind, one of the important things that I'm trying to, uh, you know, help these healthcare workers convey is that if we had done this seriously in the beginning, we would be done now. You know, if right. we had committed to the type of behavior that's necessary and fully yeah, absolutely right. Then it's just there's so many stubborn people. This would be over. Right. But like, you know, do not go to that wedding, you know, get married later. Right. Or do it, do it on social media. I mean, again, there's all of these ways of doing things. I mean, I I have given uh, countless concerts as, you know, I've given classical concerts. I've given big band concerts. I've done live streams with the Killer Queen experience, you know. And uh, even us, the 11 of us, look, we only did our, our live stream in Philadelphia at an arena where only us and our production team 
were in the in the whole building and our production team were 20 feet away. We didn't interact with them. I mean, it's you have to be smart and you have to think of the long game. You know, sure, you might miss the wedding wedding today, yeah. but what are you going to miss more? The wedding or the people at your Thanksgiving dinner table? You know, we've proven it works in the beginning. I mean, it, when the numbers drop significantly in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Philly, too. Um, yeah, we yeah. got numbers down below 100 for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I looked yesterday and it was almost 900. It's been over a thousand. Yeah, and, and there was a, an, a nurse who I photographed who said, you know, basically this message is just one opposed every single day. And I don't know the exact words, but he can probably put his thing up on the screen. You know, but he, he said, you know, basically we did a good job in the beginning and then people just stopped caring. And when people stopped caring, that's when people get sick. And I wanted that... to actually share another screen real quick uh, because your your beautiful collection of photographs and these stories are being uh, are being exhibited by the Science History Institute right now in Philadelphia, correct? Yes, that's at Third and Chestnut Street. They called me kind of early on um, in April, probably. And so they were interested in in doing an an outdoor exhibit. and it took us a while to put it together. They did an, an amazing, wonderful job. So there are a number of life-size portraits. They're like 10 feet across um, outside Third and Chestnut. And they did an incredible audio tour podcast about it where they interviewed a bunch of the people who I'd talked to. And it really sounds like a This American Life episode. I was just floored when I heard the beautiful and important work that they did uh, it just made it seem it, made it seemed to me like um it was you know better than anything i could have done um it made it seem real it made it seem like somebody else did it uh you know because i i don't know about about you justin and jason but when i do something i think like oh this is flawed because i only see the flaws in it and when i look at things you know that other people did i'm like oh their stuff's so much better than mine you know if only if only I was as smart as them or as talented as them or, you know, I had the, you know, super I, I got to be honest. Your stuff is fantastic and you shouldn't feel that way, but I completely get it. And I actually take comfort in the fact that you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> and when I heard this podcast that they did, I was like, holy moly. Like, that sounds like a podcast made about really good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it was me. And so then I like, you know, I kicked into high gear and I was like, all right, you know, all that stuff that, you know, I had the, 20 emails that I had piled up from them where I hadn't done stuff. I was like, I'm going to do this stuff now. <laughs> you know, it's obviously serious. Um, that must have been surreal to see your stuff just blown up like that for this exhibit. Or are, are you used to that? No. Um, I don't think and I remember the first picture that I had printed in a newspaper was in college and it was on the, the cover of the, the school newspaper. And I ran out to find it and I, you know, I still have 50 copies of it, I'm sure. Um, and you never get tired of that. Um, I it's, guess it's so. Like every time, every time I see something uh, like that, I'm, I don't know, I, I you know, I feel good. It's, it's a nice feeling. But, well, they were unrolling these, and, you know, they're like life-size images. I don't, I don't I can't remember if I've ever had a billboard or, any, well, I guess I, I've had, I have had a couple big images, um, but it still, it was remarkable to see these um, pictures like that. And to know that they're doing it in a way that engages the community in a safe way and that keeps art happening in Philly, which I think is super important. Like, how do we do, because I think art is necessary to our humanity. Absolutely. It's Amen. so cathartic just to have a creative outlet. So how do we do it? in a way that's safe, but still allows us to have these, you know, conversations and feelings and, you know, art speaks from a place that's, you know, not science. It's, you know, I don't want to say it speaks from your soul, but it speaks from, um, you know, an emotional uh, portion yes. of, our, of our brains. And I think it's important to have those emotional outlets. So, I was super happy that they have 
these pictures that people can walk past and see. And there are also postcards there. So you can go to the exhibit and get one of the postcards. And they're, they're changing the postcards every week. You can actually go there and collect the postcards of the images because I thought it was important to give people um, something that they could take away and also something that they could share with people. So you can fill out this postcard and you can send it to your, you know, brother, cousin, whatever, because we're living in our houses now. And I've found that like getting a letter, getting a letter, that's amazing. Like getting a handwritten letter. That is, that is pretty cool. Uh, people should not fret when they hear this because your exhibit's going to be up for the next six months, correct? Yes, it's going to be there well after the snows. And uh, <laughs> when the snows melt, you'll be able to walk down there. That's fantastic to hear because, uh, again, this is something that's really important and these stories need to be told and we need to be reminded of it, uh, you know, often. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to not only hear from people who are inside the buildings seeing things firsthand. It made me realize that if you say like, well, you know, I'm going to be unsafe because it's my life or whatever, you know, I'm going to go to this party or, or, or whatever, and it's only affecting me. It's not only affecting you because talking to these people who are working in hospitals, they have to watch you die and they don't want that to happen because they're, they've devoted their whole lives to keeping people from dying. And it's going to haunt them. It haunt, it does haunt them. It haunts them already. And I don't think that there is any doctor or nurse or medical technician or janitor who works in an ICU who is not traumatized mm -hmm. already by seeing this. You know, and I talked to nurses who had had patients die before and they, you know, had patients die at the rate of like, you know, one a year or two a year or, you know, sometimes more than that if they worked in an ICU, but they're not used to just their patients dying. Come Not in this lifetime, no. O over over 200,000 in nine months. And not only that, but these people aren't dying well either. Um, yeah. Alone. They're dying completely alone uh, because you can't really go into the room with them in a way that a nurse constantly has been taught to do and wants to do. You can't go in there and hold their hands um, because it requires you to put on PPE every time you go in the room. And there are limited amounts of PPE. So if you don't have to go in the room, they discourage you from going into the room. And if you go in the room, you can't go into another room without changing your PPE again. So, you know, there are, you know, a certain number of minutes in between room visits that you can make. And a lot of these nurses told me that, you know, they would go into somebody's room and they would be dead. And they just died sometime while nobody was there. And they're, you know, the ICUs are full. And so they have other areas of the hospital that they are making into ICUs to put, you know, more people in. And they're working, you know, 12 hour shifts doing this over and over and over again. And sometimes people in the hospital get sick and, you know, nurses have to work longer hours or doctors have to work longer hours. And I think you can ask them to do this for a period of time because you know, that is, to some extent, that is the job of a healthcare worker. Uh, but you can't ask them to do it forever with us not helping. You know, um, you can say, like, here's an emergency. I need you to, you know, do this. But you can't say this is going to be an emergency forever. And you're just going to have to, like, this is your life from, you know, from now on. That's untenable. Yeah. Yeah. And by doing these pictures, you've contributed in a positive way to this part of history, which is awesome. I hope so. My uh, grandmother gave me her photo album before she died. And uh, I went through it with her and I looked at every single picture and I asked her about every single picture. And there were a bunch of pictures from World War II and I asked her about World War II and she didn't have really any specific memories. And I found that. I don't know, kind of sad because uh, it was, you know, certainly a monumentally important period of time. And I wanted, I realized that, you know, 40 years from now or 30 years from now or whatever, you know, kids are going to be going through trunks in attics and they're going to find our stash of homemade masks and, you know, whatever else. And they're going to ask, you know, what was it like during the pandemic? And I wanted people to have an answer to that, like here are very specific things that people did and people said and people felt. Uh, so I wanted to help write that down for sure. Yeah.
we, need, we need to buckle down and um, you know put on our uh, our big boy pants and get through this. Yeah, and what what you've kind of done this reminds me of uh, you know a, a lot of uh, my friends that are in the military. You know, mm -hmm. they you know it's kind of what they say: you just check in on your brothers. This is a, a very big way that you've done this. You've checked in on your family, also known as the community. You've checked in on them to ask them, you know, what's going on? How are you? And these people are have been so uh, just candidly honest with you. And um, so uh, I had I I put up the the website. I'm going to put it up again, uh, guys. Check it out. Um, so this is uh, you know between us and catastrophe.com. Also in the description uh, below, I will be sharing the link to the. Um, uh, of course, I um, the, okay. the science history um, institute. Yeah, institute. Yes, I'll be sharing theirs because people are still nervous about going out. As it should be. Yeah, yeah. And you know and the science the science institute uh, the science history institute has uh, not just the uh, has given us this opportunity to enjoy your beautiful photographs. Uh, printed on repurposed masks, which I think is such a, a powerful statement, even you know, even more so. Not just are these photos powerful, but what they're printed on is just so much of what is the the tapestry of what life is now. Um, but you know, people they still may feel you know awkward, you know, be, even standing on on the on the sidewalk enjoying this art. Uh, the uh, the Science History Institute has the photos for view uh, online, and they also have these these people's stories, as you said, uh, done as a podcast, which was so beautifully done. I listened to it earlier today, and um, so again, you can still experience uh, what Kyle has done for uh, you know what what he's been able to do with his remarkable abilities, and. Uh, bring you a little more understanding of what it is to be quite literally between us and catastrophe. Thank you.